It's time for more work. I'm just telling you, man, it can be special if you keep working. It's going to be the same formula. We are battle tested and ready for anybody who shows up. Yeah. Team on three. One, two, three. Team. You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to another victorious edition of the Huddle Up Podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me is my co-host and partner in crime on this voyage. He is your Denver Broncos reporter for 24-7 Sports. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, the Broncos entered Week 12 facing an obstacle that no NFL team has ever had to face in league history, taking on their third straight opponent that was on at least a five-game winning streak or better. But Denver came out on top. We'll talk tonight about implications, but wow. I'm about to do something I don't think I've ever done before, and that's quote Vance Joseph. He said after the game that the Broncos aren't just hoping for wins anymore. They're going out and making plays and, you know, making themselves victorious. And I absolutely agree with that sentiment. That was an incredible win. And I can safely say now that I'm buying in to the Broncos as a dark horse contender for the playoffs, which seems insane to say, but uh, it's, it's all coming together. Yes, indeed. It absolutely does feel like this thing is coming together, and we're going to get a lot more into that whole idea here in just a second. But first, we got to take care of and dispense with some small matters of business. You guys, make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod, if you want to be able to make it into the Mile High Mailbag, which we do at the end of each and every episode. Also, take some time. Make sure you leave a creative review and a five-star rating, especially on iTunes and Stitcher. But you can also find us on iHeart, YouTube, Spreaker, uh, Spreaker, Google Play, Spotify, pretty much anywhere and everywhere that you can find a podcast on the Internet. And then we also got to say thank you to sponsor of today's show, Audible. You guys, go out and get yourselves a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Huddle up. They give you over 180,000 different titles that you can choose from, whether you're on an iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. You've heard me talk about it week in and week out for the better part of the last year. I use this app each and every day because I love to read, but I don't always have time to sit down and turn the pages on the books that I want to read because I'm trying to bring you guys the Broncos analysis and news on the regular. So this allows me to get these books under my belt, Audible, while I'm multitasking and doing other things. And you'll love it too. So go to audibletrial.com slash huddle up and take advantage of that free audiobook download and 30-day trial. All right, so we'll jump right into Orange Colored Glasses because the Broncos went into Week 12 as home dogs, and yet they upset the Pittsburgh Steelers, which, by the way, Big Ben cannot catch a break at mile high. He's now 2-5 and five all time. The last time he got a win in Broncos country was 2009, which was, of course, we're talking about Josh McDaniels' era Broncos. So since Von Miller's been there, he's not been able to, Big Ben, win at mile high. So the Broncos emerged 24-17, two-game winning streak. They're heading down the stretch, and I got to put on the orange-colored glasses. You intimated right at the top of the show there, Zach, that it's time to believe. And we talked about it again when the Broncos pulled out that great road win against the Chargers last week that it was encouraging it was a huge win but if Denver could beat the Steelers they'd make believers out of us and they went out and they did it and after the game what's more Zach and tell me what you think about this after the game I wrote that it's time to it's time for Broncos country to dispense with all the myopia and the negativity and all the Vance Joseph hate and really embrace and believe in this team because you live for your team to be relevant and competitive. And Zach, that's exactly what the Denver Broncos are now sitting at five and six with a schedule that from here on out gets significantly easier. It is time for this fan base that's kind of been punch drunk from all of the losses to really just shake that off, get behind their team and see where this thing goes. I would say it's a time to be excited right now. And and Broncos fans haven't experienced that since the the beginning of the season and the beginning of last season. I mean, uh, excuse me, happiness 
it is so uh, a fleeting feeling for the Broncos fan base with the team underperforming. Now they're one game out of a wild card spot. They're entering a very soft portion of their schedule, a lot of winnable games there. I mean, you never know what could happen in the NFL. Part of being a fan is getting lost in the in the optimism of it all and, and the euphoria of sport and football. I, I think Broncos fans should start to believe a little bit. I wouldn't circle them in as a, a wild card, a clinching team by any means. A lot could still happen, but it, it's a good position for the Broncos to be in. They aren't just forming a winning streak. They upset two legitimate playoff teams in back-to-back weeks. This win, to me, was a big barometer test for this Broncos team, which is starting to seem like they're all coming together. They're all kind of melding together. Uh, The offense is falling into place. Keenum's getting more comfortable. The defense is going out of their way and making plays now. And and even the coaching. I mean, I got to give Bill Musgrave a lot of credit for this game. I think he called a masterful, masterful game. They had the offense keeping the Steelers' defense off guard. Uh, There's no major coaching gaffes. Even Tom McMahon did a great job with Colby Wadman, who's turned into kind of a weapon on specials. I mean, it's a good time right now. So I would have a little optimism. The glass is a little more full than it was last week, and I would enjoy this win. They have a very winnable game against Cincinnati next week. They can get to 500. You never know what could happen. And that's all I'm saying. I mean, really, it's it's nobody (laughs) – one thing I want to try and stress to people is I'm not saying, look, it's Broncos or Super Bowl bound or bust. That is not what I'm saying because just like I wrote in the piece after the game, this team still has a very long road left to hoe. But these last two games should make believers out of you that they can get it done. At the very least, as Zach said, it's time to reinstill some excitement into your team because it really has been a down and dreary type of season because you're coming off 5-11. and 11. You sign this quarterback to come in $18 million a year. You have this phenomenal rookie class. You expected a lot more than 3-6. and six. And I totally understand that. But one thing that I'm stressing in the, in the written piece and I'm stressing to you now on the podcast is Vance Joseph has been dealt a f- unbelievable gauntlet of a schedule in his second year. Now, going into this season, you know, Parity reigns supreme in the NFL. No one could have guessed that the Denver Broncos' uh, schedule would turn out to be this difficult as it has been. But, does I mean, that doesn't matter. Regardless, it's been a phenomenal, unbelievably difficult test for this team. And were it not, Zach, for a missed field goal at the end of Week 9 against Houston and arguably some questionable coaching from Vance Joseph at the end of the game there, We'd be talking about a Broncos team who knocked off, who went 3-0 and against all three of those teams who entered their matchup on a five-game winning streak or better. And so I think that's why I'm saying it's time to start appreciating what you got a little bit. Live in the moment. Stop focusing on the, the after the season, who's going to be the head coach. You know, the Broncos need a new quarterback. Those are all questions that are going to come when this season is over. Right now, it's time to really go all in on your team and get behind them because if they can go on the road and knock off the Chargers who just obliterated the Cardinals, no surprise, and then also legit contender like the Steelers, it's time to really start giving Vance Joseph, Case Keenum, Bill Musgrave, Joe Woods, and everybody else the benefit of the doubt and see where this thing goes. To your point, they're also one incomplete pass away from upsetting the Chiefs and and already being at the 500 mark. This team is a lot better than their record indicates. I'm a firm believer in that. This is not, to me, a 5-6 and team. Certain things bounced their way. Certain passes were completed. A little better coaching. Uh, They could have a very, very good record. They would already be contenders, if not front runners, to make the playoffs. So, yeah, they're better than the record indicates, and and today was an all-around win for them. And I want to make the point that while it's it's okay to celebrate this and it's encouraged and it's a good win, it doesn't overwrite everything else that went wrong earlier. And it doesn't completely buy Vance Joseph a third year yet, Joe Woods. It doesn't mean Bill Musgrave should be this full-time coach forever. It's just you have to live in the now. So right now they're victorious. Right now they're on a two-game winning streak. And they have to be honest, Cincinnati, as Von Miller so eloquently put it in his press conference. <laughs> right. And that's that's a small focus. And I, I think Vance, to his credit, I will say this in his defense, he has instilled the right motivation. He's taken it one game at a time. He's not looking at the big picture. And I think that's the right way to go for an embattled second-year head coach. You take it by the inch, it's a cinch. By the yard, it gets hard. Now, that's a saying that one of my mentors in this business gave me a long, long time ago, but it, it holds true. It's just one of those cliches that, you know, there's a reason why they're cliches. It's because they're true. The Broncos are keeping their focus on the present one game at a time. And so far, since they have 
presented that philosophy, Vance Joseph, to his team, it's paid off in spades. They're not worrying about the future. They're not worrying about the big picture and what's going to happen after the season. They're focused on the now. And one takeaway, too, I think we got to talk about here, Zach, is that this Broncos team, you said it. I mean, they're far improved well over the team, their counterparts from 2017. But this is also a team I think is sending a very strong and blaring signal up the chain of command to John Elway that, look, this isn't a scenario in which Vance Joseph, a lame duck head coach, has quote-unquote lost the locker room. This is a team that has still that is still buying in to Vance Joseph, believes in him, is fighting their tails off. Now, I agree with you that it doesn't erase what has happened so far and the fact that Vance Joseph has won so few games in his first season and a half as head coach. And this these two wins in no way guarantees that he's going to get a third opportunity at the helm. But this team is fighting for their head coach. They're buying him time. They're buying him basically a a new lease on his head coaching life as the head coach of the Denver Broncos. And I think that, you know, we can't get away from what we said a couple weeks back. Might have even been last week, actually, that the only way from the mailbag, I think we got a question on this, the only way Vance Joseph remains head coach of the Denver Broncos in 2019 is if this team makes the playoffs. I still stand behind that. I think that's the only way he saves his job. But so far, so good. I mean, if you're really looking at this thing from the long view, two huge wins against two really tough opponents. And just like you mentioned his quote after the game at the podium, one big difference is you take the first eight games of this season and compare it to the last three is, you know, the Broncos are, instead of finding ways to come up short in the key moments late in the game, they are finding ways now to make the difference, make those game-changing plays that spell the difference between just another close, hard-fought loss and a victory. You and everyone who listens to this podcast knows that I'm not in favor of Vance getting a third year. But if they go from 3-6 and six and they run the table or finish 9-7 and seven and just miss the playoffs, I think, yeah, that, that'll convince Elway to give him a third year. I, I, at the way they're going, they're building this momentum at the perfect time. It's better to do it now than to start the season strong and then to fizzle away. They're getting into rhythm at just the right time. So if they go on a winning streak, you know, unfortunately for Broncos fans who want Joseph gone, he'll probably come back. It would give Elway enough um, ammo to bring him back for a third year, and then whatever happens next year, whatever happens next year. The, to your point, though, the players, yeah, they're fighting for Joseph, but I think I feel like they're fighting for themselves too. They know that so few players in that locker room are untouchable, and after that trade of uh, Akeem to leave Demarius Thomas, they know that they're just one false move away from being sent home or away too. So they're also fighting for their own jobs, and it's a it's a pride thing. And I think Chris Harris Jr. he sparked his play because he was a candidate to be traded at the trade deadline. At least a report indicated that, and he yeah. was mad at that. And he he you know it was a an axe to grind for him. And the team kind of is is building around that disrespect, and that's fueled these two these two wins. So winning cures all. It can help Joseph's job security. It can help the players' job security. As long as they keep winning, good things will happen to the coaching staff and the players. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that the you, you want to compare the 2017 Broncos to 2018. I talked about in the written piece, leadership is is completely different. The old guard is gone. Your Trevor Simeons, your CJs, your Talibs, your Demarius is they're gone. In you got Case Keenum, you got Todd Davis, of course, the steady leadership of Von Miller. It's all making a huge difference. And one thing that I think is kind of interesting, the way I'm approaching this with a little bit of a different mindset, is that Vance Joseph sold himself, built himself, at, you know, part of his interview process on his resume, this leader of men. Now, we've scoffed, we've laughed at it over the last 18 months because it just hasn't come out in the wash. But we're starting to see him, he and his staff really – buckled down and if they can be the ones to figure out how to turn what felt like an an insurmountable tide of negative momentum and flip that around and make a real strong playoff push I mean that's a head coaching staff you want I'm not saying that right this second I'm saying if that's what ends up happening you would literally be tempting the fate of the football gods uh, to to fire a head coach that figured out how to turn around something a team that had seemed so just stuck in neutral for so long, but he figured out, rolled up his sleeves on his own. They figured out how to how to climb out of it to some success. I mean, that's if you're John Elway, you're Joe Wellis, and Gary Kubiak, and that five man brain trust in Denver, 
you don't exactly want to cut off your nose to spite your own face. And so those are all future considerations, obviously, at this point. The Broncos are on a two-game win streak. Yes, they've beaten two very good teams, but they still have a road left to hoe. And speaking of which, as you mentioned, next up, the Broncos go on the road. They face Cincinnati. Then they go on the road again. So the next two games, even though they're not the strongest of opponents, they're on the road. Cincinnati and then San Francisco. Then they come home. They're against Cleveland in Week 15. Then they go on the road one more time to Oakland, and then they're home for their their season finale Week 17 against the Chargers. So, you know, the old Broncos, the the Broncos of the first half of this season, I would be a little bit worried looking at this final stretch of games because what we saw is this was a team who would, you know, really get their dander up and play hard against quality opponents. And then they'd play down to teams like the New York Jets and the Baltimore Ravens in losing efforts. I don't, I really, with this kind of new mindset they have, and you talked about it, the small focus philosophy, I really don't see that happening this time around. That doesn't mean they're going to win all these games, but I don't think you're going to see the Denver Broncos lose control of their poise and they'll continue to play this similar type of gritty, tough, you know, making plays in key moments. You're seeing the defense start to get some takeaways. I mean, it's a winning formula. And they're a team right now, Zach, that no quality NFL squad wants on the schedule going down the stretch. Yeah, listen, I'm willing to give the players more credit for sure. Case Keenum, Bill Musgrave. I'm just not quite there on Vance Joseph just yet. And people might call me biased or I have a, an agenda with him. All he has to do is not mess up and the, for the Broncos to win. If he just gets out of his own way, this team is way better than the record indicates. So the players, I think, for me, this is just my opinion, they deserve most of the credit for these upset victories. They've had good game plans and they've executed, but the players have really risen to the challenge uh, coming out of the bye week. Now, in terms of their schedule... Yeah, it's easy on paper, but there's some sneaky competition in there. The the way the Browns are playing right now at Baker Mayfield, and that's going to be fun for Broncos fans and media members like you and I who wanted Baker Mayfield in the Broncos uniform watching him play them. I mean, Cincinnati with Jeff Driscoll or Andy Dalton, these are all trap games, so to speak, for them, spoiler games. I mean, they have the Chargers team in the season finale. They have the Raiders who would want nothing more than to dash Denver's playoff hopes. So, yeah, they're cupcake opponents on schedule, but the game is not played on paper, and the Broncos know it's one game at a time because, like you said, um, this is a team who took the Rams down to the wire, uh, back-to-back upset victories, but then got blown out by the New York Jets. So they're so up and down, they haven't earned that benefit of the doubt just yet. you got to take it one game at a time. If they can beat Cincinnati and then go back to 500, we got something cooking here. I'm just not ready to go all in yet for the Broncos as a, a potential number six seed. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you can't, you can't sit back and say the Broncos are going to make it to the playoffs. I mean, you can't, even in your wildest imagination, the, the road is just fraught with peril still. I mean, you look at Cincinnati – yeah, they've, they've been sliding. <clears throat> we all know basically the limitations uh, that, that Marvin Lewis has and, and the Bengals as an organization, but they're kind of hovering around that same area that the Broncos are in, a little less, obviously, as far as wins, but they're still alive and they're still fighting for their potential place in the playoffs. San Francisco, they're going to be out of it just looking to play the upset guy. Cleveland, though, you circle that game as, you know, I think it's you could really make an argument that the Broncos – should go in and win at Cincinnati and at San Francisco. But that Week 15 game against Cleveland, Cleveland is a similar team as the Broncos who started off terribly this season but are starting to pick up momentum at the right time. That's really going to be – I mean, you already spoke to the storyline aspects of that game that are going to create additional intrigue. But the fact that both teams are going to be vying for that sixth playoff spot, that second wild card spot, is going to make that Week 15 game all that much more compelling. What scares me about the Broncos against you know the remaining schedule is that they kind of struggle with physical defenses and physical teams. And the, the Chiefs aren't really physical, and the Rams aren't overly physical, but the, the Browns are with Greg Williams, and the Bengals are with that coaching staff and what they do over there. These are two physical opponents, and if it's in a low-scoring game, it can go either way. And they're on the road. It's not going to be easy. Uh, that's why I'm not circling Ws yet in the, in the win column. These are You still have to play the game. And the Broncos, to me, just because they won two games in a row, they haven't given me that benefit of the doubt that say, oh yeah, they can just go out and beat the Browns. They can beat the Bengals, even if Dalton plays. Bring them on. You know, bring on, bring on Alabama. We want to beat them. I mean, it's not feasible just yet with the Broncos. They have a ways to go. It's a good marked improvement, but there's still work to be done. Yep. 
And that's the thing, though, is, is again, before we move on and, and actually share some of our takeaways and, and observations from the game itself, I want to stress again to those of you, and I'm seeing it, and it's like a, a – there needs to be a sea change because the vast majority of time – I mean, you could go to either one of our Facebook pages, Mile High Huddle Facebook or Denver Broncos on 24-7 Sports Facebook. It does not matter what the topic of the article is. The comments, majority of the comments will – say something negative about Vance Joseph. Like, it could be something like Bradley Chubb breaking NFL records, rookie records, blah, blah, blah. And people will be commenting, fans of the Denver Broncos, fire VJ, fire VJ, fire VJ. <laughs> and it's like, dude, enough is enough, you guys. If any of you out there are holding on to this negativity, I'm not saying even that you're wrong about Vance Joseph. All I'm saying is that as fans – you live to see your team win. You live to see your team be relevant and be competitive. And right now, that's what you got. So what I'm saying is dispense with the negativity, put it behind you, and focus on what you got right now, which is a Broncos team that, against all odds, has found a way to play its best ball when it matters most and are now on a two-game winning streak. So let's move on, Zach, and talk about some of the takeaways from the game itself you had Obviously, I think we got to talk first off about the engine that continues. I mean, we can talk about how great Case Keenum is playing uh, the last three games especially, but the engine driving this thing continues to be Phillip Lindsay, who is the first running back this season as an individual to eclipse the 100-yard rushing mark against the Pittsburgh Steelers. He carried it 14 times, 110 rush yards, one touchdown, his longest rush of the day was a 32-yarder. So Lindsey continues to just get after it. Royce Freeman, six carries, 17 yards, kind of a the last couple games kind of meh since Freeman's returned from that knee injury. But you got to tip your cap to Phillip Lindsey, who just continues to make his claim against, I think, Saquon Barkley for that Offensive Rookie of the Year award that's coming. Forget tipping my cap. I'm going to give him my cap. The, the kid is just absolutely incredible. He gets better by the week with more and more carries and more and more workload, more and more pressure and responsibilities. He now is the Broncos' single-season franchise record holder for rushing yards by an undrafted rookie. He passed Selvin Young, who held the record so seven. I mean, to come in as an undrafted free agent and make the team and get Terrell Davis's number and beat out Royce Freeman and do these things on a weekly basis, it's just – you don't see it too often, and you don't see it from a, a, a player who's in, from the team's backyard. I love the kid watching him. He's such a fun runner, squeezes through a, a, literally any hole, uh, incredible speed, blink and you miss him. I love, as just an NFL fan, watching him play the game. And the Broncos were so fortunate they scooped him up and he didn't take his talents to the Ravens. And it became quite clear to me in this game that he is by far and away the Broncos' number one running back. He makes Royce Freeman look so slow by comparison. Mm-hmm. It almost seems like they don't even need Freeman at all. Right. Lindsey can do it all. He, he can. He's a, a Swiss Army knife. And they just, um, in the beginning of the year, to me, Freeman was the better back, but now it's not even a contest. Now when Freeman comes in the game, I'm disappointed. I want to see more of Lindsey, you know? So uh, there's nothing more can be said about him. He's an incredible, incredible talent. It feels like the Broncos are trying to keep his touch ratio, Lindsey, right around 15 per game, which, you know, I'm kind of torn on this topic because he's under 200 pounds, he's five foot eight. You got to be wary of the wear and tear on a relatively diminutive running back like Philip Lindsey. I get that, but at the same time, your chips are down now. I mean, it's it's win or go home. The Broncos almost have to run the table in order to really have a shot at that sixth wild card spot. So what I'm saying is, you know, dispense with the playing it safe stuff and just start feeding this kid even more because it feels like the more you give this kid touches, the more you get him into a a rhythm, the better off you're going to be as an offense, the more productive he's going to be. But I do understand the flip side of that coin, Zach, where the Broncos recognize how important he is to them as an offense, but also the fact that, you know, he's not the hardiest, biggest, thickest running back uh, to ever suit up in the orange and blue. No, but he's incredibly durable, and he's shown that he can take the punishment and keep going. I mean, over the last two games, he's averaging 7.6 yards per carry, but he's gotten 25 carries. I mean, what's wrong with that picture? 
You got to give the kid more opportunity. Get that screen pass to Freeman early in the game today. It should have went to Lindsey. I mean, you got to just know who your best player is, and you have to play him. If an injury happens, an injury happens. It's part of the game. I don't want to say run him into the ground or ruin him, but you got to keep leaning on him. He is far and away your best player, and he gives you the best chance to win. So I would keep feeding him more. I would give him as much as he can handle and keep going, riding that train until the wheels fall off. And, uh, you know, see how the cards play out. I just I love watching him play. So I think he should be getting 15 to 18 carries a game minimum. And whatever happens, we'll have to see. You know, let the, let the chips fall as they may. I mean, just to give you some contrast here, imagine what kind of numbers Philip Lindsay would be putting up in the NFL today if he were getting touches ratios like Saquon Barkley, who is coming oh. off 27 carries, 20 carries. 13 carries, but then nine receptions, so 24 touches. I mean, you go, you can go look at his game log for this season as a rookie, and he's out touching Philip Lindsay easily by 10 to 15 touches per game. And so basically, we know that if you get Philip Lindsay 15 touches in a game, he's going to get you 100 yards. You get him 30 touches, he's probably going to get you 200 yards, and so on and so forth. But the Broncos are going to continue to probably walk that line and play it safe as far as, you know, trying to balance getting him more touches with keeping him, you know, protecting him in whatever way he can. But one thing I'll say, and I agree with you, is that, you know, he hits the hole fast. He's unbelievably quick. He's got the jump cut. He's got the quick twitch that you look for. I mean, he's got almost everything, that fighting spirit, that tenacity. But he also, the way he runs and the way he lands – He's he's an incredibly durable runner. Like he just knows when to go down. He knows when to stop fighting. He knows he has that instinct, so to speak, that self that streak of self preservation that I think helps a guy who's been as diminutive as he throughout his football career to stay alive. And I think that's something that the, the coaches in Denver need to start considering a little bit more too. And there's even a, a video on Twitter of him getting pushed over the sideline and he's flipping over and in one motion gets on his feet and just strolls back to the huddle. I mean, he literally does anything well. When he gets tackled, he falls forward. He protects the ball, uh, knows not to keep it extended out. He does everything right. And every time I watch Philip Lindsay run the ball, I wonder how 32 teams, including the Broncos, pass up on him. It, it's it, To me, it's incredible how yeah. this man was not drafted. And I say that every time, every single time I watch him play. Yep, absolutely. I mean, it's inexplicable how Philip Lindsay went. We've talked about it time and time again on this show. It's inexplicable how all 32 teams missed on him. And even Vance Joseph in this week leading up to the game was asked, did the Broncos ever come close to actually spending a draft pick on Philip Lindsay? I mean, we're talking about David Williams in the seventh round who didn't even make the 53-man roster out of camp. And VJ claimed he couldn't remember, you know, so much, so long ago, blah, blah, blah. Seven months. I Super think long ago. We know the truth. The truth is the Broncos felt like they kind of were in on a secret with regard to Lindsey. You know, they have their ear to the floor throughout the pre-draft process. They could sense that there wasn't much scrutiny on Philip Lindsey, not much demand for him. And that they, their odds were going to be good that they could get him after the draft, especially knowing doing their own due diligence. He grew up a Broncos fan, played at CU and all that. But they'd be the first ones to tell you that if they had any idea he was going to be this good, I mean, he wouldn't have gotten past the first round from any team, including the Broncos, right. arguably. I mean, if they could know for a fact Lindsey was this good, I mean, if they knew that going in, I don't know. Do they take Bradley Chubb at number five? or do, uh, Who knows? I mean, but that's how good Philip Lindsey has been. Right. I mean, like – we're talking about a player commensurate on the same level as the number two overall pick in the draft in Saquon Barkley, who has, call it 40 pounds on Philip Lindsay, and he's getting, again, about twice the amount of touches per game. So it's quite amazing. But let's talk about Case Keenum really quick here. You know, I think he's played solid the last three games. I've touched on that already. He's gone three consecutive games now without turning the ball over and zero interceptions over the last three games. But honestly, Zach, this was his most impressive game to me as an analyst because, I mean, that win on the road at L.A. was good. He was solid, but he just seemed to make more plays in key moments here. He had to have he, he seemed to have more of like a that killer step on the throat instinct in this game. And he right. only passed for 197 yards. He only attempted 28 balls, two touchdowns, finished with a rating of 99.9. But to me, this was the most complete and effective performance overall from Case Keenum, the quarterback. 
you know, the way you put it, I tend to agree with that. He was in charge, and I think the, the offense was gelling, and that's what we noticed from this game. Because I, I noticed the same thing, that he was stepping up and, and moving around the pocket and not being tentative at all. The Broncos were very aggressive, and that's why I give Musgrave so much credit for today's game. But Keenan was on point, and it's no coincidence that if they don't turn the football over, they win games. If they just don't hurt themselves, they can win football games. And I want to bring it up again because it's a, a wild theory, but the Broncos traded Demarius Thomas, and in three games, they won two, and Case Keenum has a 3-0 TD inter, uh, interception ratio. Right. I mean, is there something there? I don't know. But, you know, I think he was holding Cortland Sutton back. Sutton's making good catches. They got Deshaun Hamilton involved. The tight ends are coming along. You give Keenum these weapons and the offensive line is protecting him, he can do some damage. Just don't turn the football over. The play calling has gotten better. Keenum's gotten more confident. The offense as a whole has developed more chemistry, and you're starting to see the results. If they just play clean football, this is what I said when the Broncos signed Case Keenum, they don't need Tom Brady. They don't need Aaron Rodgers. They need a steady hand. Someone who doesn't turn the football over and truly manages a game. If he can do that, the Broncos can win, as we've seen. Let's talk about Cortland Sutton, because I would agree with you that up until this game, at least, he had, I mean, it was like Demarius who? I mean, he was doing a great job. Right. He wasn't necessarily taking over games, but he was doing well. Today against the Steelers, he had four targets, hauled in only one ball for 14 yards, and then he had that crucial, I think it was two drops on the day, but then he had that crucial drop on third down, which is extremely disappointing. So I think at this point for Cortland Sutton, it's like the training wheels are off. You know, we invested in you in more ways than one. We got rid of Demarius Thomas to open the way for you to have more snaps and more of a focus in the offense it's time for him to start coming through I think a little bit stronger in a sense you saw Emmanuel Sanders in a very very real sense help take over the game offensively for the Denver Broncos especially in the second half we're yet to really see that happen from Cortland Sutton now last week he had 78 yards receiving it was especially on that final drive he he was the final reception it was almost 30 yards that put Brandon McManus uh, within field goal range to to end that one, win the game for the Denver Broncos. Today, though, this was a game in which I know he he's not going to be happy with his overall performance, let alone his stat line. I think he's one player that really has to step it up in order for the Broncos to keep this swell of momentum going down the stretch. Yeah, I don't. Sutton's not there yet in terms of his development to have a floor of production. I mean, the Broncos' offense has been so inconsistent that there's so many, only so many scraps to go around and so many heads wanting food. Sutton's just not there yet. The only two players that are guaranteed to have their touches in this offense are Emmanuel Sanders and Philip Lindsay. Everyone else, though, is a wild card. He will get to that point eventually, but this offense still flows through the running back and their top wide receiver, and now they're getting their tight ends more involved. I mean, you can only do so much. So Sutton is getting better. He's shown improvement, um, but you're going to have games like this following up games like last week. Yeah, I mean, that is a good point. You look at the Pittsburgh Steelers, for example, and we're going to talk about uh, the defense here in just a little bit, but we're talking about Big Ben Roethlisberger just in the first half had 31 passes. So there's a lot of guys on that offense who are going to eat week in and week out just by the game of numbers, just by the law of averages. You got Case Keenum, conversely, you know, throwing the ball, whatever it was, uh, 32 times, I think, 28 times, excuse me, on the day. And so... If you're a guy like Cortland Sutton, when you get four targets, you need to haul them in. I mean, you need to be hauling in three out of four targets each and every game just to maximize your potential to make an impact. But it's nothing to get worried about, Broncos fans. I mean, he had an off game today, was was certainly an off game for Cortland Sutton. But we know what his football character is. He'll bounce back from this. And I am still waiting, though, for that just take over a game, breakout moment, from Cortland Sutton, and I think it's still on the table. It's still going to come. But one last thing I want to touch on here, Zach, before we move on, is we saw the Broncos' offensive line last week on the road against the Chargers play so well. I mean, over 100 yards rushing. Case Keenum did not get sacked. That You had the GM, John Elway, after the game talking about how this team might have inadvertently stumbled upon their best O-line combination. How do you feel like this O-line played in its second game together as a starting five? 
there were a few hiccups, certainly more than last week, but definitely better than I have ever saw coming. When I heard Leary went down, then Paradis went down, and even Max Garcia went down, there was so much reshuffling and players that are playing out of position, guards playing tackle, t- tackles playing guard. It, it's, a, it's a musical chairs, but they really did luck into a good combination here. Yeah. They all have plus, plus mobility, plus power. They're great in run blocking, and they've held up well in pass pro, and they face two pa- good pass rushing defenses. It's not a fluke so maybe they have something here and like i said on last week's show it gives the broncos good insurance because leary is a cut candidate paradis is a free agent uh valdir is, is going to be a free agent they have to make some decisions there and to have players that step up in their absence i uh, really bodes well for the team yeah i mean it's basically the ideal scenario on the left side of your offensive line you need athleticism and guys who can move you've got that now with garrett bowles and billy turner on the right side, going from center out to right tackle, you need long, strong, powerful guys who can really excel man on man in the power scheme. And you got that in McGovern, you got that in Wilkinson, and you got that in Valdir. So, ideally, it really is a, a, an ideal setup here for the Denver Broncos. And so, moving forward, I think I agree with you. Today was there were a couple more hiccups. You saw Wilkinson, for example, get beat on that one third down sack, but still overall. The complete body of work. I'm not inclined to disagree with Elway in that this might be a scenario in which the Broncos stumbled upon inadvertently their best combination as far as the starting five. Now, one last thing I lied when, about the offense. One last thing: tight ends. 78 of Case Keenum's passing yards came via the tight end. Jeff Hireman, two receptions for 44 yards, including that awesome 29 yarder on the wheel route in the first half. Matt Lacoste turning in a solid, solid performance as a receiver with three receptions for 34 yards in that touchdown. Arguably should have had all four of his targets caught had Vance Joseph deigned to challenge that one play, which was, to me, was kind of 50-50. I could have seen, I don't know if he would have won that challenge, but it was definitely there. In if this was 2017, that was definitely a ball that was ruled incomplete that Vance Joseph challenged would challenge but with the current rules being what they are now on on what is and what isn't a catch and just kind of the way the cookie has crumbled for him this year I understood why he chose to hold on to it and you know what didn't hurt the Broncos the next play Philip Lindsay busted it off moved the chains the Broncos would go on and stall in that drive but they still picked up that first down that Lacoste's uh, incomplete pass uh, cost them. I was screaming for Joseph to challenge that because to, to me it was clear as day. They would have won that. That was a catch in my opinion. And you never know what uh, – I think it was Tony Carrenti who had the uh, refereeing duties today, what he would have ruled. Well, I don't know what it is with Vance Joseph and challenges, but the man is just not good at them. In terms of tight end though, even Brian Parker was targeted today. The Broncos are going crazy. I mean Matt LaCoste, Chef Hireman, and they're – leading the team and receiving mean, Hyman at 44 yards on two catches. They're getting them involved now. And I think they want that safety blanket for Keenum in the middle of the field. And uh, it, it's just, I think Musgrave went out of his way to make a concerted effort to get the tight ends more involved. Ever since Jake Butt went down, Hyman's usage and Lacoste's usage mm-hmm. have gone way up. Yep. I know. I, I shudder to think how productive Jake Butt could be right now with the offense finally starting to get into some rhythm and, feel its oats you know it's it's just such a bummer that he suffered his third ACL injury of his career but we still have a lot to get to we're going to talk about the defense some takeaways there we're going to get to your questions and in reaction in the mile high mailbag but first you guys we got to say thank you to sponsor today's show my bookie because we all know that watching football is fun but it is more entertaining you guys when you have some action on the games and you've heard us talking about it for weeks now some of you are still on the sidelines. Whether you're an expert or a rookie, you should be betting at my bookie. If you're the kind of guy or gal that likes to bet a little and win a lot, like playing the numbers on roulette, you can create a big parlay. You pick three teams to win, and if you end up hitting all three, you could turn $100 into 600 And there is so much to bet on right now. you got college basketball, football, of course, NBA, NHL. you got custom props, even eSports, you name it. My bookie is the one bet, though, I know you'll be happy with all year. I recommend these guys because I really trust them. My bookie has been in business for years. They've got great online reviews, and their mobile site is easy to use. Sign up this week, and my bookie will give you a 50% deposit bonus to jumpstart your bankroll. It's a great way, you guys, to bank even more money when you win. Also, 
Make sure to follow at BetMyBookie on Twitter. They personally respond to every mention and DM, and they've given away more than ten grand in free money to their followers this football season. So you'll be the first person to know as soon as new odds and props are posted. But don't miss out on one of the best weeks ever to bet on sports. Log on to MyBookie right now. Use promo code HUDDLE and get 50% deposit bonus in your bankroll. That's promo code HUDDLE. You play, you win, you get paid. All right, so just a couple things I want to touch on here on the defensive side of the ball and what we saw from the Steelers before we get to everybody's questions and concerns in the mailbag. I think the first thing we got to touch on, though, uh, is the fact that the Steelers entered this game absolutely not fearing Denver's passing defense in the slightest. I mean, they went into this game as with one of the best offensive lines in football. I mean, that we know. This offensive line has been playing out of their minds for the Steelers. So that helped give them confidence as far as what Miller or how Miller and Chubb could, you know, mitigate their any potential gains throwing it as often as they did. But they threw all caution to the wind. I mean, Big Ben, that first possession, they didn't even run the ball one time. They drive it all the way down. And, you know, Justin Simmons with the great leap blocks, you know, that blocks the field goal. That was great and all. But this offense for the Steelers did not fear what the Broncos had on a passing defense scale. And I think for the most part, the Steelers got what they wanted out of their passing offense. They were able to exploit the Broncos between the 20s. So, But one thing you got to really tip your cap to the Broncos for is the takeaways. And then in some situational and key moments, they were able to get the stops they needed to keep the Steelers from scoring a lot of points, which would have really put Keenum and company behind the eight ball. Great mind, because I tweeted, I think it was on the first or second series, that they have absolutely no respect for the Broncos' uh, passing defense or secondary with how often they were throwing it. So much so that they cut off the nose despite their face by just misusing James Conner. They didn't use him enough. He was underutilized. Yep. And uh, they did that because they, they saw something on film that said the Broncos' pass defense was susceptible. Now, whether that's Bradley Roby coming off a concussion or that had that foot injury or Tremaine Brock back there or, or cutting Adam Jones, they thought they can just whoop the Broncos through the air. And it, they hurt themselves. And they should have got James Conner more involved. Uh, to the Broncos' credit, I think they did a good job with Antonio Brown. I think Chris Harris Jr., uh, Bradley Roby did okay. Uh, the secondary was pretty good. They held up better than I thought. Yadam, he got a lot of publicity because he was targeted so much, but I think he actually did pretty well. Yeah. I would actually say that it was just one of his better performances of the year, which isn't okay. saying much. Even Langley was in there a couple snaps, so it was weird to see. Yeah. Um, the, the takeaways, though, to me, that was the biggest thing I saw from the defense today that separated them from this year from the 2015, 2016, 2016. 14 units, they create turnovers. They're causing havoc. They're getting the football back to their offense. They're making those game-changing plays. I mean, that hustle play by Will Parks oh to force goodness. a fumble at the goal line, uh, that was incredible. I mean, it, it was just incredible. Uh, they had the, the takeaways, the interception, Shelby Harris coming down with the game ceiling pick in the end zone. I mean, he skied for a pass. It, it was just they're finally getting back to that, that swarming aggressive defense, and I give Joe Woods a lot of credit because he's kind of tinkered around, not dropping people back into cover letting Chubb hunt, Von Miller hunt. Uh, the, the secondary is tightening up a little bit. It's just encouraging to see, and I like that brand of football that the Broncos play. They used to play under Wade Phillips. Yeah, I mean, that that hit that Will Parks laid on that tight end, I mean, the hustle. Beautiful. You said it yourself. I mean, just the hustle and the tenacity was just phenomenal. But the hit he laid to not only impede his progress but knock the ball loose. I mean, you saw his arms do the, you know, the – stinger look thing where they kind of just go jello for a second and then he lost control of the ball touchback i mean that's a game ball type of play by will parks that completely saves the the game from completely swinging in the direction of the pittsburgh steelers gives the broncos a little pep to their step and it was a sudden change that was just absolutely came in the right moment because that dude was wide open on the backside of that play action fake Nobody on the Broncos' side of the defense saw that coming, but Will Parks was able to sky, or not sky, but Will Parks was able to close the gap, make that phenomenal hit as a safety. Loved seeing that, and especially with Sua Cravens. Now, I haven't had time yet to go and look at the snap count, but I did a film piece in a, a VIP film piece in, a couple days ago, leading up to this game, questioning and, and trying to examine why. Last week against the Chargers, you had 
Sua Cravens start the game as Denver's dimebacker and third safety. I mean, he was in there each and every series, and then about halfway through the second quarter, he was gone. And I tried to look at the film. Will Parks came, finished the entire game. Cravens did not hit the field from about nine and a half minutes into the second quarter beyond. Mm-hmm. It was all Will Parks, and I was trying to figure out why. And the only thing I could figure is, you know, he he had his moments. Antonio Gates exploited him a couple of times, but it wasn't anything extreme. It wasn't the type of thing where you go, ooh, that was so bad, he's a liability, we got to get him off the field. It told me that maybe he had aggravated something. He had that arthroscopic procedure on his knee, uh, whatever it was at the end of August, early September. Might have even been a little bit earlier than that, but that cost him the first eight games of this season. And now he's starting to get his playing legs underneath him. He's playing more. I had a feeling just watching the film that the only explanation for him not seeing any snaps in the basically the whole almost two and a half full quarters of play was it has to be some kind of setback, some kind of pain, some kind of discomfort. And then again against the Steelers, I don't know about you, Zach, and again I haven't looked at the snap count and I've only watched the game one time. I didn't I don't remember seeing a whole lot of Sue Cravens on the field, which tells me there's something going on there, but my biggest takeaway was these young DBs, I mean, veteran quarterbacks know when the inexperienced corners take the field, and Big Ben certainly instinctually picked that out. He was going after Yadam, but I think, I mean, you said it, Langley was even on the field for some snaps. The the young guys who needed to really step up and, and show their worth did just that, limiting Big Ben's ability to really gash them. I mean, we're talking about Bradley Roby mostly, a little Tremaine Brock, but mostly Bradley Roby, who was on the losing end of the biggest plays that the Steelers were able to pick up through the air. So you got to tip your cap to Isaac Yadam. That's got to be a huge boost for him from a confidence perspective. It's crazy that you said that. I had put that together that Cravens really wasn't around much. I, I can't remember hearing his name called that much, so I, I wonder what's going on there. I know that Will Parks is a boy of Vance Joseph. I mean, even going back to last year, and he you know, he made a nice play today. But yeah, I thought that he, they were going to have a big role for Cravens, and he's kind of been a bit player. He strikes me as a type that I think Vance kind of um, – uh, takes a standoffish attitude toward, kind of like Marquette King, you know. I, and I don't think he's earned the trust of the coaching staff yet. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors or whatever, but it's obvious, and that's a great observation by you, Chad, that they value Will Parks a lot more and probably DeMonte Thomas when he's healthy over Sue Cravens right now. So uh, that's interesting. We'll have to see if he uh, re-injured something. I don't, I don't I don't, think he did, but that'd be interesting if he, you know, if that didn't happen and he'd be gone right. for the rest of the year. Uh, Yadam, yeah, I mean, he held up. I, I'm not going to say he played great. Ben actually missed that receiver. He had him on the first play after uh, Yadam came in, and the, I think he overthrew him. He made a diving attempt, and it was incomplete. He he grew up in today's game. It was a benefit for him. It was a trial by fire, and they needed to see what they have in him, and that is why Denver made absolutely the right call getting rid of Adam Jones. they got to get their younger players more involved. They have to see what they have in Langley and Yadam, and I think you know they held up pretty well. Yep, and that's the thing, too. One last on Cravens is that he wasn't on the injury reports all week long. He wasn't on the post game right. chargers injury report and he wasn't on any of the practice reports leading up to week 12 against the Steelers. So again, my thing is if you're not going to use him, if he's compromised in any way physically and you just don't want to report it, why do you have a roster spot for him? I mean, if he's, if he's really not mm. going to be making any kind of an impact as a dressed player, you would probably find other creative, more impactful ways to use that roster spot. But anyway, I digress. Long story short, though, the biggest takeaway from this Broncos defense on the day is just the bend, don't break, and kind of predatory nature. Bradley Roby, you know, he giveth, he taketh, he giveth, he taketh. You know, he had a couple of, uh, he had one great pass breakup against the Steelers, but then he got burned on that 97 yarder from Ju- Juju Smith Schuster. Then he comes back and forces a fumble on James Conner, which reminded me a lot of the divisional round when these two teams played back in 2015 on the way to Super Bowl 50. The Broncos needed a not only a stop, but they needed some kind of game-changing situation to stop the Steelers from getting an even bigger lead in the second half, and Bradley Roby was able to pop his arm in and, and force a, a fumble on Tucson, I think it was, the Steelers running back that – the, the Broncos recovered and were able to get some points out of it and went on to win that game. It was very similar to me, and the Broncos, fortunately, were able to capitalize on that and put up some points. And that's one thing, too, Zach, before we move on to the mailbag that I think is worth talking about, is that this Broncos team, 
you know, they're not lighting up the scoreboard, but compared to the 18.3 points per game this team averaged in 2017, I mean, just going into this game, the Broncos were averaging 21 points and some change, which is three, it was a little bit more than three points, so a little bit more than a field goal's worth of points better than their 2017 counterparts. And what we've seen from that, the, the takeaway is that many of these games the Broncos have won and lost have come down to those three points. And so it doesn't sound like a lot, but in the NFL where the margin for error is so slim, sometimes it's non-existent, those three points, it's a pretty significant improvement over 2017. And if they can continue to get these 23 and 24 points, that's a winning formula because this Broncos defense, for all of its faults, I mean, they're, we're not talking about the 2015 Broncos, let's face it, they are finding ways to consistently hold teams below their weekly average from a points perspective. So in that sense, you got to tip your caps to them. I don't think there's any doubt that this year's outfit is better than last year's. I don't think there's any person that would look me dead in the eye and tell me this Broncos team is not improved from last year. Maybe not a playoff team, but improved. And that three points, like you said, that makes all the difference in a game. You give this Broncos defense 24 points consistently, I like their chances. Even with all the holes they have and the players going down, this defense is still talented enough to lead a team to the playoffs depending on the offense not turning the ball over and and the coaching not falling apart. This defense is still that good. So if they can get 24 points a game and you can give them a lead, I mean, one thing that struck me about this game is that the defense forced uh, a Steelers, uh, you know, a punt late in the game. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, the Broncos offense coming back on the field in late in the fourth quarter with a lead. It was just, I'm so used to them coming back from behind that, to see that graphic, they were leading a game in the fourth quarter with their offense coming back. It just struck out to me. So if you give this defense that many points, I like the Broncos' chances a lot. Yep, absolutely. And just again, to give you a little bit more context on the achievement the Broncos had today holding the Steelers to 17, this Steelers offense entered Week 12 as the fourth scoring offense in the NFL, averaging just under 30 points per game. They were averaging 29.9 points per game. And yes, they were on the road in a very hostile environment, but the Broncos held them to 17. And that is a massive, massive win for that uh, defense, just from an emotional and a confidence perspective. I mean, this is the type of game that is a signature performance for a defense that makes each and every guy in that unit feel like they can go toe-to-toe with any team in the NFL. And one last thing before we jump to the Mile High Mailbag, get to your questions and and reactions, is I got to remind you guys that you got to take some time, go to the website, milehighhuddle.com, click on the green banner, and pull the trigger on becoming a Mile High Huddle VIP subscriber. Tomorrow is going to be Cyber Monday. We're going to be running. This is, is, for those of you listening on Sunday, you're getting this information early, but we're going to be running a phenomenal special in honor of Cyber Monday, where you're going to be able to get VIP membership at a fraction of the cost. And what that does for you is it gives you access to all of our Broncos film rooms where we break down what we're seeing from an X's and O's, from a personnel perspective on your team each and every week with several different articles on that topic. Plus, it gives you access to our VIP members-only message board, our MHH Insiders, where we share any of the inside information we pick up along the way. And this is the time of year where we start really picking up with the contacts we have established across the league, especially in the scouting, the personnel, the draft community. This is really when we start picking up our most valuable nuggets of information for our VIP members. So you're going to want to capitalize. I'm telling you right now, if you've been thinking about it, haven't quite gotten over the hump to pull the trigger, tomorrow, Monday, you're going to want to jump on that. And just wait, go there, check it out. You'll see what the special is. I don't want to give it away, but I'm telling you right now, you're going to be able to become a a Mile High Huddle VIP, get an annual subscription for a fraction's fraction of the normal cost. So check that out. Go to milehighhuddle.com. Make sure you do it on Monday. Click on the green banner. You'll see what the special is. You'll get locked in. But let's move on to the Mile High Mailbag because each and every week, Zach and I are here to be your football priests. We're going to offer you that absolution, the answers to your burning Broncos questions. Sometimes you got to exercise the demons, and sometimes you just got to get your wiggles of excitement out. You got to just show how stoked you are on your team. And coming off of two really hard fought wins against two really good teams, I don't know how you couldn't be completely stoked on the Denver Broncos at this point. But let's check the mailbag here really quick. Our first question comes from Ronald Newman, Jr. 
I think this is the first time we've ever been asked a question by Mr. Newman, but his question, Zach, I'll serve this up to you. Why is Joseph so scared of challenging? I said the same thing earlier in the pod tonight. I don't know what it is with him in challenging. He, I don't know if he doesn't trust the people upstairs. He doesn't trust his own eyes. He doesn't want to burn a time out, time out or lose a challenge. I don't know what it is, but that's by far uh, one of his biggest Achilles heels as a, as a head coach is knowing when to challenge, why to challenge, and, and to actually throw the red flag. I don't know what it is with him. It's got to be a lack of trust either with his eyes or the people yeah. upstairs. There's really no other ex- explanation for it, except maybe too just that, you know, it's like if you put your hand on the hot stove and get burned once or twice, you know, you're going to think twice about it, henceforth right. or forever. He hasn't had a lot of success this year challenging plays, which I think also plays into his decision-making process. And now this one comes from Ryan. I'm going to go through these pretty quick because we're running out of time here. But Ryan, it's more of a reaction, but he sent to us from Chris Harris was that a top three career performance by Chris Harris? And then he says he was all over the place. I think you could put it up there. What were your thoughts on Chris Harris's performance? Who? Let me just one last thing before I serve this over. Chris Harris vowed two days ago that this was not going to be like that week 15 performance he had against Antonio Brown in which Antonio Brown had 169 yards receiving on, I think it was like 16 receptions. Then he had two touchdowns. Now, not all of his receptions were at the expense of Harris, but both touchdowns were, and it was the first touchdown Chris Harris had had relinquished in coverage in over two years. Now, that was back in 2015. Lots changed between now and then, but he vowed going into this game it wasn't going to be anything like that. And if you look at Antonio Brown's stat line, I mean, nine receptions, it it looks like he was productive. But for Antonio Brown, he actually wasn't. Nine receptions, 67 yards, zero touchdowns, a long of 14. And I think any team, Zach, that goes into a matchup against Antonio Brown, if they could go in knowing they could hold him or limit him to a stat line like that, I think all 31 other teams in the NFL would view that as a victory. Yeah, I'm with you. I'd say it's up there. I don't know about top three because he's had so many great performances. But, yeah, it's definitely up there. Uh, one thing that they, they did was neutralize the, the Steelers' weapons, except for Smith Schuster on that one long play. They were a lot of quick hitters over the middle. The, the pass rush was kind of flustering Ben a little bit. They kind of beat him up. But Chris Harris Jr., man, he's just an, an all-pro every year for a reason. He was bumping Antonio Brown off his route, sticking in his hip pocket, shadowing him all over the field. Um, I give him a ton of credit. Great player. Can't say many good things about him. You know, there's just uh, nothing to describe him. Top three, I don't know, but definitely up there in terms of yeah. his career as a Bronco. It was definitely a, a, a highlight performance from Chris Harris. It's, I mean, when you consider it from a matchup perspective, going against Antonio Brown for a lot of the game. But we move on. Matthew Slagle, his question is kind of a double whammy. He says, I still don't see us making the playoffs, but anything is possible. Do you think this might seal the deal for Vance to be back next year? And then his second question, Zach, I'll serve this right over to you. Also, what position group do you like for us to take in the draft if we finish somewhere around 9-7? and seven? To, to question number one, no. Simply put, no. It doesn't cement anything. Either the Broncos as a contender or Vance on the hot seat or off the hot seat. That's to be determined. Like I said, two games don't overwrite everything else. To me, he's still on the hot seat. To me, he still has something to prove. The Broncos have to finish with, it, at the bare minimum, a winning record, 9-7. and seven. Anything less than that. It should be grounds for dismissal. They finish with a winning record or make the playoffs. Yeah, I think he's back. But based on today's game, nothing has been determined. He's still in the hot seat. Still have work to be done. There's still a game below 500, still out of the wild card picture, and he hasn't bought himself that much job security with only one win. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really change much other than it's kind of created some momentum, and it's, if anything, given the Broncos' brain trust kind of a, some pause to whatever wheels they'd put in motion looking for that next head coach I think right now things are on hold that's the best Vance Joseph could hope starting this season three and six and that kind of answers also the next question from Bronco forever who asked is this a playoff team I'll say this look we can't make any kind of overarching guarantees after a, you know two consecutive wins even against the quality opponents that the Broncos have, have beaten here do I think this team could make the playoffs? Yes, but we still need to see them sustain this consistent level of play for a couple more games before I would feel comfortable and confident going out on a limb. Zach? Can they make the playoffs? Yes. Do they deserve to be in the playoffs right now? I'm not convinced. I, I For a 5-16 and six team with so many faults, they showed earlier in the year, even if they put it together, I'm just not convinced just yet. 
are they a playoff team right now? Technically, they're not. They're one game behind, still under 500. Um, they've lost two games in a row to the Chiefs, or two games this season to the Chiefs. They lost to the Ravens, who are in the wild card picture. Uh, they lost to the Texans. So if you put it that way, by the associative property, they're not a playoff team. But they are a playoff caliber team. They have a a, a possibility of being a, a playoff team. They're just to me, just not quite there yet. Yeah, they just got to keep this momentum rolling, and if they can, anything's possible. Chad Montana at C Montana ninety one says hope has been restored. These were the toughest two games remaining. Or actually, I guess his question is, were these the toughest two games remaining? I think that they. These last two games arguably were because even though you've got the Chargers again in Week 17, that's going to be in Denver. So the road matchup with the Chargers was always going to be the the stiffer test for the Denver Broncos. But again, I think we've spent enough time on the schedule, definitely for this podcast, that the Broncos, things get a lot easier, but that means that they cannot drop their guard. And then last couple things here, and then we're out of here from Aquaman. He says, great win, Zach. What will it take for Denver to run the ball more? Lindsay's 7.9 yards per carry, still a 28 to 20 pass to run ratio. I honestly don't know. I mean, Musgrave watches the film every week. He pours through it, and he he even calls it out in press conferences. He makes fun of himself, very self-deprecating, but yet he won't establish a ground game. I, I honestly don't know, and I think now with Keenum performing better than he has, it's going to give Musgrave even more justification to make him a franchise thing and to try to justify his contract and everything. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know, it, like if Chad alluded to, they want to preserve him throughout the course of the year to worry about his frame holding up. I don't know, but if I were the Broncos, I would run him until the wheels fall off. I would give him at least 18 touches per game because he's putting up the numbers. He's not having one good game here and then blowing the rest of the games. He's consistent. He's getting better with every week. So it's going to take Musgrave just establishing that identity and sticking to it. And until he does, you're going to see a lot more Case Keenum. Yep. Hey, quick shout out to to people like Christy at Miss Christy 78, who is a dedicated, loyal listener to the show, listens in week in, week out, and is always sharing the podcast on social media, giving us shout outs. We appreciate those of you, our listeners, who do that on the regular. It's great that you listen. We love that. It's also great when you go above and beyond to help spread the show to new listeners. And doing so on social media is one way to do it. We appreciate that. But also making sure you leave a creative review, rate the show, is another way to help us get out there to the Broncos fans out there in Broncos country who don't know necessarily about the Huddle Up podcast. And also another thing, too, is... Some of you don't know this, maybe each and every game, we, we, during the game, we, we hold what we call our game day open thread where I kind of live blog the game and then all of the members and readers of Mile High Huddle 24-7 Sports, they jump on and they share their comments and we engage in conversation in game. And I'm seeing people funnel from the Huddle Up podcast listenership to the game day open thread and it's great to see and i want to welcome those of you who haven't taken the opportunity to do that yet to follow suit people like christy who have joined us on the thread and really helped to keep the conversation going and make it that much more interesting so two quick things there but last thing then we're out of here from dion i think we've already touched on this but it just goes to show kind of where broncos country's mind is at this point he says three and six seems so long ago i love this team's grit the AFC better hope we don't get into the playoffs that yeah the Broncos are one of the teams that NFL teams don't want to play right now those you know those uh, basement dwelling teams that get hot in the middle of the year and they start to make a run you never want to play those teams you want to stay far away from them and they could you know strike some fear into NFL contenders uh you know they, they could make some noise and I want to see that happen I want a Broncos fan base that's gone so long without a positive experience that sustains to experience that again. And I just, um, I'm just not willing to just put on the rose colored glasses or the orange colored glasses and keep them on all the time. It's a good win. Enjoy the win. Look forward to facing a cupcake schedule on paper, but just know that things change week to week and don't buy in just yet one week at a time. We'll have to see what happens. I'll tell you what, this one place where, where Zach and I are, we're, we're going to have a departure is I am buying in. I'm believing in this thing right now. I'm not making any overarching guarantees that they're making the playoffs, but I do think with this team playing the zone that they're in right now, there's there's some there there, so to speak. And if they can capitalize on this this schedule down the stretch, all bets are off in terms of them going from three and six to winning a wild card. And we've seen Broncos teams in the past 
do some pretty impressive things as a wild card seed. You had John Elway's Broncos in 97 enter the playoffs as the wild card, go on to win it all. Now, granted, that was with a Hall of Fame quarterback, a Hall of Fame tight end, a Hall of Fame running back. I mean, that's far cry from what the Broncos have right now. But even go back to 2011, Zach, the Broncos start 2-5, and five, insert Tim Tebow, miracles proceed to flow forth from his blessed hand. Broncos finish 8-8, eight and eight. they win the division, they win a division or a wild card game, get trounced in the in the divisional round by, this, by the Patriots. But I think right now, if Broncos fans, even a trip to the playoffs would be a, a, a emotional victory for Broncos country, let alone something like 2011 where they actually win a playoff game. So at least at this point, again, all I'm saying is be encouraged by your team, be positive, dispense with the negativity. Again, just forget about it for now. Focus on what's going good, which there's a lot to hang your hat on right now if you're a Broncos fan. Right, you're going to be the angel on the shoulder. I'll be the devil. <laughs> that's, that's an okay arrangement. Uh, but yeah, listen, I'm not going to try to be the Grinch or, or throw you know uh, a, a cold water on, on an exciting opportunity that the Broncos are going through right now. Yeah, there's a lot to be happy about. Yes, it's better than losing. Yes, they're on the upswing right now. Yes, they have momentum. All I'm saying is don't expect them to be in the playoffs. Don't let that devastate you. Focus on the smaller wins of the year, like taking down AFC contenders, like these rookies blossoming. You have offensive rookie of the year candidate defensive rookie of the year candidate a great nucleus of talent look forward to that uh be happy with that blossom with that and just like chad said leave the negativity behind it's been too much of it and it's time to move on from that yep absolutely just enjoy the moment enjoy it right now while your team is relevant once again but hey that's going to do it for this week's episode of the gut reaction it's been a great one you can find my partner zach kelberman on twitter at kelberman 24 7 Myself, at Chad and Jensen. You guys, make sure you're subscribing. Make sure you leave a five-star rating. Make sure you review the show. We appreciate you. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you soon. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.